Every day when I wake up in the morning, I see the sky and I think about the things that you've made, all the beauty and your glory is showing. Yeah. It never bores me to look at the ocean. The waves are crashing, the water spraying up in my face. I look above and all the seagulls are soaring. Yeah. Got to overcome the darkness so we don't get caught in the middle between the hopeful and the heartless. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling because today is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful day. All the planets surround me The way they orbit just boggles my mind The way the sun keeps on shining, yeah We've got to overcome the darkness So we don't get caught in the middle Between the hopeful and the heartless So, hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Cause today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay It's the day that the Lord has made Day that the Lord has made. There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has it's made. The day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling. Cause today is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful day. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live with Doug. Good morning, Curtis there on Facebook and Mike and Ron, Keith. Good to have you all with us. I just realized I can see comments both from Facebook and YouTube, but I'm assuming you can't see each other on those other platforms. That uh, that makes sense now based on some other things that happened. Anyway, glad you're with us. Uh, my plan is to wrap up today the uh, discussion of the church, unless I just get a lot of uh, questions that we need to spill over. Uh, I've enjoyed this dialogue. Uh, I've been encouraged by hearing from you. Some people challenging some things, some people saying, yep, I want that. Even some saying we're going to start that or we have started that and they've asked for help to kind of guide them along. And that's all very encouraging. I think, uh, uh, I think there is a, a future for a, uh, a new model or an old model renewed kind of thing. Um, so we're going to keep talking about that. On the, uh, on the discussion of what comes next, uh, the two most frequently mentioned uh, topics so far have been the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation, and uh, those are interesting, not surprising, especially Revelation. Everybody wants to study Revelation. I have spent very little time, well, that's not true. I've spent a lot of time in Revelation. I've never taught through Revelation, uh, so... If I were to do that, I don't, I don't have the time to really dig in and put together a, a good presentation. One thought is uh, I could almost walk through it and study out loud <laughs> t- together and, uh, and not, uh, I don't know, that intrigues me a little bit to dive in and that would promote more dialogue and I'd love to hear from other thoughts as we go. So uh, kicking that around a little bit, that'd be a, a massive endeavor, I think. Uh, Hebrews would be great. Hebrews is always great. And so anyway, if you have thoughts, uh, feel free to leave in the comments. I may 
I don't know. I may do something else the next couple of days and think about it and then uh, come back and start a new series next week or whatever. Ah, I'll keep thinking. But anyway, just want to let you know so far, Revelations and Hebrews are kind of the two leading. Uh, hey, Michael. Michael says, this has been awesome, Doug. It's cemented many of my own convictions. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Good morning, Dale. Glad you're with us as well. So uh, feel free if you've got questions that I've not addressed, throw them here in the chat. I will uh, take a look at them. Uh, and as, a, as I'm waiting to see if you have any of those, uh, I thought I would just throw out a couple of, again, sort of summary uh, thoughts on what I've learned. We're not a year into this yet as far as our home fellowship, where we started, I don't know, April-ish. So we're, what, nine months, eight or nine months, something like that. Um, I will tell you as a man who spent 25 years as a pastor in a traditional model, I'm loving the idea, I'm loving the fact that we have no business meetings and all the things that are attached to things like business meetings, that has been so wonderful. Uh, and that you know spills over to all the other things of a building to have to deal with. Uh, and I think I've said this before, I have an entrepreneurial spirit. I, I've built a couple businesses and the corporate side of the traditional model, I don't, uh, I don't run for that. I, I enjoyed that. Um, but I enjoyed that because of the way I'm built and what I desire. But as far as what the church should be and should be doing, and as far as uh, my leading and shepherding a flock, it is really wonderful to not have to mess with any of that. Uh, you know, the proverbial jokes of carpet cover colors and, and uh, uh, carpet, I mean, colors of the walls and, and facility, all the facility stuff. Uh, and, and just the, that whole corporate element, it is, is pretty wonderful to not have to worry about any of those things. Volunteers, Always asking for help for volunteers. And, and why do we have to do that in the traditional model? Because we've got the production to put on. And I don't mean that as crassly as it sounds, but there's an element in which that's true. Uh, we've got a, 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 another service coming up, whether it's Sunday or Good Friday or Easter or Christmas Eve, uh, Thanksgiving, whatever. We, we, we have these services. We have these projects. We've got youth group, youth retreat. Men's retreat, women's retreat. We have these events, and, and I, 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 those are great events. Don't get me wrong; I, I loved those, and I still would. Yeah, you know, uh, guy has asked me to come speak to his his men's ministry uh, this year, and, and I'm happy to do that kind of thing. I enjoy. There, the, there's something wonderful about getting away on a retreat. So that's you know, in no way, we might do some of that here in, in our home fellowship. I'm just saying. The, the, the volunteer, the corporate, the recruiting, the, all the details. We spend so much time on that in, in most churches because that's what we do. The church is largely meetings and meeting places. And to not have to worry about any of that has been, has been wonderful. Uh, it, it allows our group to focus on things like we looked at a little bit yesterday, like in Romans 12, 9 and following where it says, uh, let love be without hypocrisy. There, there's not a lot of room for, well, there's no room for uh, an insincere love when you know everyone so well, like we do in our home fellowship, uh, when you spend so much time together. And I'm, I think I've described this to you. It's not just Sundays, although we spend a lot of time on Sundays. Did I, did I mention that people came over around 10 on this past Sunday and stayed till 10 p.m.? <laughs> We spend a lot of time together. Uh, you can't really play act at loving one another when you're together. I, the, the truth is you just won't uh, stick around. We, we've had some people visit us and they didn't stay. And, and if you're not devoted to these people, if you're more devoted to the experience, whatever that experience you're looking for is, whether it's a you know, music or some uh, some other thing. You're just not going to stick around a group like ours. So the people who stay, they're devoted to one another, which that's verse 10, right? Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference uh, to one another in honor. 
And as we have done this and, and lived together, so to speak, in our home fellowship, I've thought, how, how did we do this in the traditional model? Were we really devoted to one another or were we more devoted to the, the theological tradition, uh, more devoted to the, uh, the corporate elements? That sounds weird to say, but do you know what I mean by that? Um, how did we give preference to one another uh, in, in, in honor? Um, it's certainly more prevalent and more obvious when you're a close-knit fellowship with uh, people together all the time. So just the contrast of, of the building and the, the events that take place in the building driving what we do as a church versus really having to, by necessity and desire, devote to one another as the primary things. That's It's been pretty good. Uh, let me see what Keith has said here. Keith says, teaching and learning at the same time would be good for you and all. Uh, talking about in our home fellowship, You've made your point in the church very well, but I still love my worship, order of service, and liturgy. Yeah, uh, you love that. Uh, that's not the question, right? If we uh, if we pick things that we love, then we're making it about what we want. The question is, what does Jesus want? That's what this is, and and you make you you expose here, Keith, the point that I've been making. Part one of them. When we pick a church, we pick a church based on what we want, what's going to meet my felt needs. You, you like the music, you don't like the music. You know, some people like traditional music. Some people want pop music. You know, give me electric guitars with uh, with distortion and drums and and because it's our experience that drives so many of our preferences. And the question I've been trying to ask and answer is, what does Jesus say the church is and should be? So I would, uh, I would challenge you to, to keep thinking about that. And uh, is that really where you should be? Where you, uh, you do what you want more so than what Jesus wants? I know that's not what you mean, but... Anyway, um, some of the questions that uh, are unanswered, someone just asked me the other day in our fellowship, what do we do about uh, things like weddings and funerals? And I was pondering that, thinking, isn't that interesting that uh, even those things have become so centered on the, the corporate church? Um, do you realize that weddings are not really uh, something we find in the scripture in terms of, we don't find any expectations of weddings, do we? Do we, do we do that? Do we, uh, do we see that in the scripture? Uh, and yet we've sort of made it a church thing. And now, at least here in the U.S., uh, Mike, I'm curious uh, where you are, what the situation is. Uh, but here uh, in the U.S., the uh, the state is often largely involved in in marriage and weddings and that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so we're just you know thinking through that and then and funerals and all that. I see a few more things. Uh, Mike says, what about support for missions, et cetera? Uh, yeah, great question. So we, um, that's going to be something coming up fairly soon. And the, the difference is in the traditional model, at least what I've been part of, and maybe your church does this differently, uh, we kind of pull together money in a missions fund, in a missions budget, and then we had a missions team, missions committee, uh, and they oversaw how that money was distributed uh, to the missionaries. Whereas what we're going to do is, as we know actual missionaries personally, 
then we're going to encourage people to give directly to them. So it won't be a function of a, uh, a corporate church. It's not going to be, we're not going to run it through. We don't, we're not an organization. We're not a 501c3. We're, we're not a, we're not an organization. We're just people who get together at my house as far as the government's concerned. And, and we're not, you know, there's no, there's no unifying corporation, anything. Um, but we will encourage people to give and, and they have, because we don't, take a tithe. We don't, uh, take an offering, any of those kind of things. Um, you know, people, that money that they traditionally would give to the church. Now they can give to different needs as they come up. So it's, I wonder, uh, percentage wise, if, uh, if we won't give more this way, I don't know. Dale says, clearly you just go to the parts of the new Testament that tell us how to have weddings and funerals and how necessary they are. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Nas says, would it be called regulative worship? Um, what, 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 uh, what are you referring to there? Sorry, I lost that. I forgot what I was talking about when you put that uh, question up. Um, if you've been with us through this whole thing, I guess I would push back on the concept, uh, that whole discussion, uh, worship Nowhere in the New Testament is mentioned in correlation with gathering. Uh, Worship is our whole lives devoted to the Lord. And then when we see what the church did as it gathered, we don't see liturgies. We don't, not in the traditional sense. Uh, We don't see uh, the, you know, call to worship and then, the different elements, and then a, a benediction, all that. None of that's in the New Testament. Uh, churches met together in homes, and they they learned from the apostles, and they uh, they prayed together, they ate meals together. That's what they did in their gatherings, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I don't. I think that that regulative worship is is driven by a systematic theology approach, which I'm pushing against. Mike says they don't bother with weddings much, even in many churches, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Methodist, etc. Many don't think being married is important. They live together. It's called Sambo. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and that's that's certainly growing here in the U.S. as well. Uh, but of course, the state wants to have their hand in in everything. Uh, the, the other question that I get a lot of is, uh, I see Michael just ask any possibility for written materials on this subject. Um, well, I hadn't thought of that. So my first, my gut re- reaction is no, but uh, hmm, interesting. Um, I get asked a lot. And I've been thinking a lot about scalability of this. And that's a great question, a great unknown. Uh, the home fellowship model, I think I've emphasized this enough that my my concern in the past, my critique, if you will, of the, the home church movements of the past has been uh, eldership. It lacks eldership. The examples I had seen, and again, I'm sure people did it better than what I saw, but the examples I had seen, you know, you get a few families together and the dads were sort of by default, the elders, and that is unbiblical as far as I'm concerned. You're not qualified to be an elder simply because you're a dad. Uh, there are qualifications. We looked at them. And so if you're going to have any church and any model, the leadership is to be elders, and we've been through this, not pastor with elders under the pastor. That's not biblical. Uh, plurality of elders who are also the bishops and the pastors are the same same words describe them all, and we shouldn't make disting- distinctions. Um, and you need to have elders overseeing the flock. And so that part doesn't seem so hard. The question is, how do we scale that? And, you know, we're, we're not too far away in our own group from needing to, to divide into two, two gatherings, two congregations. You know, we fill up my home. Um, I don't think anyone, you know, I don't think anybody in our group has a home big enough that we could grow significantly more than we currently have. So at some point we're going to have to divide up And, and how does that work? How, how do we shepherd people how do we keep the uh the community and the and the the devotion to one another i was talking about one uh, idea i have and i've been talking to a couple of the other guys about this i don't know if it's going to work and we're not there yet but i've just been kicking this around could we is there benefit to um 
Well, let me let me set it up this way. We the the sort of the default setting I think is okay. We we divide into two groups meeting in two homes. You can still have the elders overseeing both groups. Obviously, the elders are not going to be present at both groups unless you stagger the time. And and I that no that makes sense to me. Um, so the then the question becomes: Do you really become two separate churches there, two separate groups, uh, kind of thing? You, you know what I mean? You see you see the the situation there. Um, so let's say you have thirty people and fifteen start meeting in that home, and you've got an elder or two there, and fifteen still meet in my home, get an elder or two there. As that as time goes on, doesn't that simply become two home churches of fifteen rather than one church of thirty? Well, if we're defining church more by eldership, then you could still have the elders overseeing both. And so, no, we've got one church meeting in two homes, 15 each kind of thing, and as they grow. So that's possible. But what you lose there is some of that uh, relationship building that's gone on as we all met together. So at least one idea that's that's on the table is, do we just have the people go back and forth, rotate? It'd take a little bit of administrative effort, but... Uh, you know, you, you come to my home for a couple of weeks and then you go to that other home for a couple of weeks and you stagger them so that you're not with entirely the same group every week. Now, there's downsides to that. I get it. Uh, but the flip side is you're regularly interacting with everybody, even if it's not every week. And I don't know. I don't. Uh, again, we're this is all in the, the brainstorming uh, mode as we as we get closer to that point. But it, it is a question uh, on our mind trying to figure out you know how do we how do we scale this and at the end of the day we just may have to realize though we love what we're doing and we love the the friendships and commitments that are, are developing the community that's developing as we are if this grows beyond what we can handle in one gathering you know we, we just may have to to sacrifice uh some of those friendships uh to to scale it i don't know we'll see but um be curious. Uh, Mike says in the Swedish late 1800s revival, people met in homes, but the homes were too small and they built red and white mission houses. Sweden has them everywhere. Many are most, most are now rarely used. Interesting. So the, the red and white mission houses was, were they, were those larger buildings so that the groups could all meet together? Is that, uh, is that what the, was going on there? Kind of a, Modern day church building, only a little different, maybe. Huh, interesting. All right, time is wrapping up here. Any other questions uh, about kind of the, the church in general, the home church, anything that I've been encouraging you on? Uh, Mike says yes. Huh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. For me, this has been a great study. It's uh, It's been encouraging as we have done this in my home to kind of flesh out what we're doing and, and see how people respond. And, and as I said earlier, I am, I, there is a, there's a need here. Uh, it, or I should say we are meeting a need. The people who have joined us love the community. And I'll, I'll tell you, I thought we had decent community in our traditional model church. And it's one of those things that unless you are a part of something like this, you, it's just going to be very difficult for someone to describe the difference. But it is a profound difference. And small groups and other community groups just don't, they don't cut it. They don't, they don't, they don't uh, become what we have become. And everybody says it. Everybody who's part of this group, who all their lives, some of them, you know, for 50, 60 years, some of them for 10 years, 20 years. Everyone says this is unlike anything we've ever, uh, ever been a part of in the traditional model. And so I can tell you this until I'm blue in the face and you're not going to really believe me until you participate in something like this. And once you do, I, it, it's, it's so hard to even consider going back. So anyway, this study has been great for me. Uh, a couple more comments here. Dale says, since there isn't a prescribed day to meet, maybe groups meet on different days and people choose which to go to based on time and location. Uh, could be. Yeah, I see. I see that. Um, interesting thought. I like that. 
He says, don't know the history, but early on, could they have been meeting in homes and the size of the group forced the idea of a church building and the form of worship has evolved into how it is today? Uh, yes. Um, certainly as the church grew, they had to find larger houses and things to meet in. Um, the form of worship evolved as I understand it from reading the church fathers and so on, um, as the leadership took over. So, so the, some, some parallel tracks kind of, they switched to a, a bishop model where the one sole, what we would call a senior pastor, basically the bishop kind of became the authority. And then fairly early on, even a, uh, kind of a sacramental view of, of what many call the sacraments. And so now you needed to get together so a, a proper uh, leader could administer the sacraments because they took on a what I'd say is an unbiblical view of the sacraments. And so you've got to have an authorized minister to distribute them, which, of course, the Bible says nothing like that. No one says it has to be a, a church leader because it's not something that's administered. Uh, it, it, it's not like that. You don't... Um, you don't need an authorized individual to say the words of consecration and give the the bread and the wine. That's that's just we don't see that in the New Testament uh, anywhere. Um, so that's that's kind of how it, it began to evolve. But yes, I think you're right. It it started off in homes and then as it grew, and that's why I say uh, we may run into that. So I'm I'm not naive to think we have found a model that has no problems. <laughs> and who knows? I you know I don't know how does this uh, how do we avoid some of the the errors of the early church, if this grows, uh, others have done it. And some of you have pointed me toward resources of folks who have done this kind of thing. However, I will say, um, and Michael, I think you're Michael uh, McCarthy. I think you're one that, that pointed this in this direction of, uh, of the brother. And now his name escapes me. Um, as I've watched some of his videos and stuff, what I see is though it, there's still a, seems to be maybe a misunderstanding, but it seems to be an emphasis on uh, the church building gathering model. And they still have a service in the traditional way. And I'm not sure uh, what, what I'm advocating for and trying to promote would not lend itself to that. I don't, I don't want to go to that. So anyway, uh, Naz says, would love to know more of NCT in uh, further study. Um, yeah, so we've got a lot of stuff, a lot of resources on our, uh, on our website and the YouTube channel. You can check out a bunch of that. Um, last year I did studies like on the law and some of those things. So, uh, feel free to, uh, check all that out. I probably won't do that here on the, the live streams anytime soon, but I'll give it a thought. Uh, Mike says, check out the term conventicle. These existed also in the UK when they were not allowed because of Anglican rules. Cool. Yeah. I'll check that out. Could be helpful. Curtis says, uh, if it's potluck every week, I'm in that's well, it is man. It totally is. We do it every week and it's great. Those Baptists have nothing on us. <laughs> Michael says, Steve Atkerson. Yeah, that's the name I was looking for. Thank you. And Jim Eliff is another brother that advocates for similar things. Excellent. All right, folks. Well, I'm going to call it a day and I guess we'll uh, consider this the wrap up of the church series. Um, if you have, if you want to weigh in on future studies further, feel free to do that in the comments uh, on this video. Um, like I said, I may dive into a couple of different things for shorter studies and then uh, see if I want to pick something for a longer study, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Have a great day, Lord willing. We will see you back here tomorrow to look at something in the word of God. Uh, take care.